what is soil? This represents ideal soil. It has 25% air, 25% water, 45% minerals, that's that sand, silt, and clay material, and 5% organic matter. Now the things that are usually a surprise to people is the 25% air and the organic matter. A quarter of this soil is air, and that's critical for proper root development. And it becomes critical in the way that you garden. You have to get more air into your soil. Compaction is really the big enemy here. So if you're in the Northeast North America, you've had a great three or four days, and I know that you've been out in the garden walking around your lawn, that's a horrible thing to do because you're squeezing that soil. It's moist right now and you're compressing it. You're squeezing all the air out and making that soil worse, which means your plants aren't going to grow as well. Now, I did it too, so I can't blame you for doing it, but just understand that that's not something you want to be doing. The 5% organic matter is also a surprise to people. I think people understand there's organic matter in that soil, but 5% seems so small. And in fact, most gardens don't have 5%. Unless you're in an old subdivision where a gardener is taking care of that soil for many years, you're probably down in the 2 to 3% range. And ideally, we want to be up in the 5%. This is the mineral component, so the sand, silt, and clay, and the ideal mixture here is 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay. It is not your job as a gardener to make ideal soil. You can't really change what you have. You're kind of stuck with it. But if you don't have this ideal, then you have to kind of think about, well, what do I have to do different with my soil to try and make it better in other ways? So some people have very sandy soil. And around here, we have quite high clay levels. So Guelph's not too bad. I have about 40% clay, but other parts in Ontario can have 60, 70% clay. We have to do something to change that, but we're not going to change it by changing the ratio of these things. So what is sand, silt, and clay? Well, silt and sand can be thought of as being identical except in the size of the particles. Sand is the really, really big pieces. And quite honestly, sand is really the same thing as these rocks or stones. They're just a little smaller when we call them sand. When they get even smaller, they're silt. What's unique about these particles is that they're very stable and they don't really do much in the soil. But silt and sand are about the same. Now clay is much, much smaller. In fact, that little dot there is actually too big for this screen. It's even smaller than what's pictured here. The difference is that clay chemically is very different from silt and sand. And we have to understand that difference. So let's compare those two. We're going to look at sand and clay. If we take some clay and we drop some water onto it, the water moves down, but it also moves sideways. The water kind of sticks to the clay and it fills all the small pores in the clay and that allows it to go sideways as well as down. And this is one of the great things about clay is that it holds water really well. Now, of course, it's also a bad thing about clay because it holds too much water sometimes. In sand, when we add water, it runs through very quickly. There's nothing to hold on to it, and it runs more or less straight down. It's a little sideways movement. We can also look at these from a different perspective. Again, we're looking at water here. On the left, we have clay. And clay are these small particles, and they tend to line up, just like people in a COVID lineup, one after the other, spaced equal distances. And they actually stack together like this. And the spaces between them are very small and when we put water on clay it fills all those spaces but in doing so it drives all the air out of the clay and remember we want 25 percent air and so this is one of the big problems with clay it holds lots of water but holds very little air everything's compressed together sand is the complete opposite we have these large sand particles and we put water on there and it just runs right through. Now it, it does coat the outside of the sand particles, but most of it is still air. So the plant has lots of air, which is a good thing, but sand tends to dry out very quickly, which can be a problem. Neither clay nor sand is really that great. But when we combine these two, we kind of get the best of both worlds. So here we have two large sand 
fine kernels and we mix it with some clay and the small clay particles surround the sand particle. And now we have something that has smaller spaces, holds some air and also holds a fair amount of water. And so this mixture is actually better than either one separate. So how do we find out how much of these materials we have? Well, soil scientists call this soil texture. Okay, the amount of sand, silt, and clay you have is the texture of the soil. And you can try to remember this because texture is kind of what it feels like. And if you take your soil and close your eyes and just rub it in the palm of your hand, if you have sandy soil, you can actually feel that sand. If you have a lot of clay, it feels more like talcum powder. It's extremely smooth. Now, if you do that, you want to wet this soil a little bit to feel it properly. But there's another way you can do this. So this is a pretty simple test you can do at home. You take some soil, take some water, put it in a jar, mix it up really good, and then just set it down. After a minute, you draw a black line. That's the amount of sand that you have. Sand is heavy, it's big, it settles very quickly. Then you let it set for an hour and the silt settles out and you draw another line. Now you have to wait for 24 hours for those small clay particles to settle out and then you draw another line. Now those lines represent how much of each of those you have and you can calculate how much of each that you have and what type of soil you have. And you do that using a soil texture triangle, which is pictured on the right here. Once you know your numbers, you can just follow those lines across. Ideally, what we want is to be in the middle of that triangle. We want clay loam. That's ideal garden soil. But again, none of us have that. You're going to be down in one area or the other. So you may have too much clay or too much sand or too much silt. That gives you some idea of what problems you might have in the garden and how you might want to treat that. Now, I've gone through this test pretty quickly. If you go to my channel, Garden Fundamentals, there's a complete video that shows you exactly how to do this and how to do all the calculations and so on. All right, so let's say we have the ideal soil. We have the right amount of sand, silt, and clay, and we mix it all together. We end up with something like this. Is that good soil? Well, it isn't really because we forgot one really important part. Remember, this soil also needs 5% organic matter. And that 5% is critical for making good soil. When we add organic matter to it, it starts looking more like this. And in fact, this is a little experiment you can do. Go for a walk in the woods where trees have been growing for quite a while and no one's farmed it, or even a meadow that hasn't been touched by agriculture or building, and dig in the soil. That soil looks nice and black. It's crumbly. It's loose. You might even be able to dig through it with your hands. You don't even need a trowel. What you have here is that the soil now has lots of air inside of it, but more importantly, those bits of soil have kind of clumped together and made these larger particles. And that's why it's so fluffy. And we call that aggregation. Soil scientists call this PEDS. Basically clumps of soil that are larger than the individual particles. But aggregation is critical. And if you have it, you have a lot of it, you have good soil. And without it, you don't have good soil. Plants love growing in soil with aggregation. So a big part of gardening is to create this aggregation. I like to think of aggregation more like this. It's kind of like a brownie. So when you make brownies, you take some eggs and some flour and some cocoa and some nuts and you mix it all together. Those are the sand, silt, and clay. I can even see the sand particles in this. It's all mixed together. And then we cut it into square. And those squares are the aggregates. And you'll notice that between the squares is lots of air, lots of spaces. And that's where plant roots grow. Inside the brownie, the stuff is too close together and plant roots have hard time growing in that. They need bigger spaces. So they grow between the pieces of aggregate. All right, aggregation is good. We're gardeners, we all want it. How do we get it? Well, here's the secret to aggregation. It's the microbes in the soil. On this slide, I've listed some of the more common microbes and the number that you find in soil. Now, the number varies depending on how good your soil is. 
you've got great soil, you've got much larger numbers, but all soil has some of these microbes. So we're talking about bacteria, fungi, algae, protozoa, nematodes. Nematodes are little microscopic worms. Those numbers are the number of organisms in one gram of soil. A gram of soil is the equivalent weight of a paperclip. So you can imagine a little speck of dirt in the middle of the palm of your hand. That has a million bacteria. I mean, if it's good soil, it's got a hundred million bacteria. Lots and lots of microbes. And by the way, this list of microbes is just some of them. There's lots and lots of different things in your soil that we never really see. It's these microbes that cause aggregation. All right, so how many microbes do we have? This must be important for gardeners to know. Well, it turns out it's actually kind of difficult. Even laboratories have trouble measuring microbes. But here's one test that's kind of fun, and it does actually work. So what you do is you go out and get yourself some white cotton underwear. You bury it, leave it there for several weeks, then you dig it up and have a look at it. What does the underwear look like? If it looks like the one on the left hand side there, you have very low amount of microbes because the microbes is what's degrading this cotton. Remember, cotton is a plant material and microbes eat organic material. If you've got a really good soil and you have lots of microbes, then you'll have what this second guy has here. His underwear is completely falling apart. I've actually written about this on my blog. It's kind of a fun thing to do, but it actually does work and they do actually run it in some soil training courses. Another way you can tell is by looking at the number of earthworms we have. Earthworms live off microbes, particularly bacteria. Now, a lot of people think earthworms eat dirt and old orange peels and apple cores. That's really not what their food is. They want microbes. But in order to find those little bacteria, they eat all this other stuff. They eat organic matter and through their digestive system, they get the microbes. More microbes in the soil means more earthworms in the soil. So there is actually a test to go into the soil and measure a certain amount out and count all the worms. And that gives you an idea of how good your soil is and how many microbes you have. So it's an indirect measurement. So now we have a rough idea how many we have and we want to improve our soil. Well, how do we get more microbes? Well, we can buy them. There are many companies now selling microbes in a bag or a jar or some sort of container. Does this make any sense? Well, if we go back to our table of microbes, look at those numbers. Your soil already has huge amounts of microbes. You don't have to buy any more. There is no scientific evidence that a jar of microbes added to your soil changes the number of microbes. I like to explain it this way. Your soil is kind of like a football stadium. Right? It has 40,000 seats. Those seeds are always full with microbes. There's only so much food and space for them, and there's room for 40,000. A bus shows up with another 5,000 microbes on it. There's no space in the stadium because we only have 40,000 seats. Adding more does not increase the number of microbes you have. Now, some of you may not believe me, but rather than buy these things, go to the woods, get a handful of soil and spread it around your garden. There are more microbes in that handful of soil than they are in the container that you're buying at the nursery. How else can we get more microbes? Rule number one is don't hurt them. Take care of the ones you have. How do we do that? Well, microbes are harmed in three different ways. Compaction, tilling, and pesticides. So number one is compaction. That's where we squeeze the soil down. That's what you get when you walk on soil. Compaction reduces the amount of air in that soil and microbes want just as much air as plants. So less air, less microbes, less plant growth. Compaction is always bad for soil. What does that say? Don't walk in your garden. It's as simple as that. Stay off your lawn this time of the year. If you do have a garden, try to make pathways and always walk on the pathways. Stay out of the planting areas. Try to stay out of the garden as much as possible. Tilling can also do a lot of damage. 
Tilling is a very popular procedure. You have a vegetable garden, everybody goes out in the spring and they till it. That actually doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't actually loosen the soil, it actually makes it worse because it decreases the aggregation. It destroys the soil structure. It also destroys all the fungi. So you have less microbes, you've destroyed the structure that your soil has, you have less microbes living in it. Pesticides can also be a problem. So too many chemicals of any type can harm microbes. But one thing to keep in mind is that not all pesticides are as bad as people make out for them to be. For instance, if you take some motor oil and drop it in your garden, you think, geez, that's a terrible chemical. What a horrible thing to do. Well, there are bacteria that eat oil. So eventually that oil gets eaten up. If we take things like Roundup, for instance, and we spread it on the soil, there are bacteria that eat Roundup for lunch. All these chemicals that we put on do harm or can harm microbes, but there are microbes that degrade those chemicals. But if you can get away and not use pesticides, that's better for your garden. How do we grow more microbes? Well, microbes need three things, air, water, and food. Not much you can do about the air in your soil except to take care of your soil. Water is important, so if the soil gets really dry, the microbes die off. And this is one reason why it is a good idea to water your garden, even a little bit if it's really dry. But for the most part, we have to rely on Mother Nature to provide that water. Where we can have some influence is on the food. We can feed those microbes, and the more food we provide, the more they grow. So how do we do this? Well, there's all kinds of suggestions on the internet, and this is a very common one I see a lot. Take some molasses and put it on your soil. It increases the micro population. Well, it turns out that's sort of true. Molasses is mostly sugar, and sugar is the favorite food of bacteria. They just love this stuff. We've got our 40,000 seat stadium filled and it's not changing very much. Now we put some molasses on it. That's like doubling the size of the stadium. Suddenly there's all this food available. The bacteria go nuts. They start eating the molasses. They start growing. They multiply. Bacteria can actually double in number every 20 minutes in a laboratory situation. They wouldn't do it quite so fast in soil, but they grow quite quickly. So you have this ramp up of population. They're constantly eating and dividing. They're happy. It's party time. Then they reach this plateau where the food runs out. What happened? Well, some of them start dying off. But the ones that are dying off are adding organic matter to that soil and feeding the ones that didn't die off. For a while, the population continues, but eventually it goes back down to the level it was before because the amount of microbes in your soil is dependent on the food and this excess of molasses food has just run out. The party's over. So yes, molasses increases the micro population over a very short period of time, but really doesn't do anything for your garden long term. It's just a dumb idea. Now, there's some myths out there. One is that if you add fertilizer, you will kill the microbes. That's not really true. So let's take a step back and think about this. Fertilizer contains nutrients, phosphates, ammonia, nitrates, potassium, calcium, magnesium, etc. Those are the nutrients that plants need to grow. Well, it turns out that microbes eat exactly the same nutrients. They also need all those things to grow. If we provide the food for microbes, how is it going to kill them? In fact, what happens when you fertilize an agricultural field? You actually see a spike of microbes, very similar to the molasses story. There's extra fertilizer in there, there's extra nutrients, the microbes increase in population, they start gobbling it all up, and then at some point they crash again because the fertilizer is running out. Fertilizer does not kill microbes. Now, if you add too much, it does. But if you add too much fertilizer to your lawn, it kills plants. You add too much to microbes, they'll kill microbes. But if you add a reasonable amount, it's actually good for the microbes. There's this belief that there's something inherently wrong with synthetic fertilizer. Well, it turns out the nutrients in synthetic fertilizer and the nutrients in organic fertilizer, and by organic fertilizer, I'm talking about manure, compost, those sorts of things. The nutrients that come out of those are identical. When they break down, they both provide 
nitrates, phosphates, potassium, calcium, magnesium, those nutrients that plants need. There really is no difference as far as the nutrients go. Now, there are some other differences, but not as far as nutrients go. All right, the other favorite food of microbes is organic material. Manure, compost, fish heads, weeds, anything that's plant-related is organic. Now, the big advantage to organics is not that they contain some sort of special nutrients. What's valuable about organics is that they release them very slowly. That fish head has to break down over time, and as it does, it slowly releases nutrients. Compare that to synthetic fertilizer. We put it on the ground, and almost immediately, that fertilizer releases the nutrients. So we have fast feed and long feed, and the long feed is what's special about organics. The other thing you can do to increase your microbes is to grow plants. Now this gets into a long story, but the short version is that whenever you have something growing on your soil, it's making roots, it's feeding those microbes. So simply growing things on your soil is feeding microbes. That's why things like cover crops are so valuable. You never want that soil completely bare. You want something growing on it. And as long as you're doing that, you're actually improving soil. You're creating food for those microbes. To sum this all up, here's the secret to good soil. Organic matter feeds the microbes. If they get enough food, the microbes grow and prosper. And microbes don't live very long, so they're constantly dying off. And as they die off, they create more organic matter. The organic matter feeds more microbes, which makes more microbes, which ends up dying and creating more organic matter. So you get this vicious cycle going around, and in that process, you get aggregation. 